All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Heather Allshuler from the George Pocock Rowing Foundation. Uh, we're excited to have, I think this is our fourth, fifth community call, um, bringing together just boathouse leaders to help create some space to discuss some of the uh, things that we're all dealing with during this uh, during this time and trying to help navigate it together. Um, you know, again, we don't know all the answers, but we are certainly here to try and create space to help figure some of the, them out together. Um, and today uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about what is up next for many boathouses and rowing facilities as potential uh, open dates start to have sort of a little glimmer on the horizon. Um, every state and community we are in is certainly in a different situation in terms of timing when we'll be legally allowed to open boathouse doors once again. However, beyond the question of when, it is fair to say that once boathouse doors do open back up, uh, uh, it probably is going to look quite different, um, at least to begin with. Uh, so today we're coming together to discuss what some boathouse leaders have been thinking about in terms of potential plans, changes and policies that they will be implementing in their clubs once doors are legally allowed to open again. Um, and just a reminder, as all of these calls have been. Um, this discussion is potent could potentially lead to some strong and emotional opinions and feelings as there are many different and passionate views on all of this. And nobody has a playbook, um, nor does anyone truly know what the future holds. So please continue to be respectful in all opinions and plans during this discussion. Also, please do um, your best to keep things sort of at a level that is valuable to all so not just very gran uh, granular specifics only applicable to your club um, and we are also going to be trying something a little bit different today to make this more interactive and create some time for some more conversation amongst everyone on this call uh, we're going to be using the polling feature to get a read on what the general opinion and feelings are on some of the topic areas we're going to discuss uh, we're also going to break into smaller breakout rooms um, at points of the call to allow for a little bit more collaborative and free uh, flowing constructive conversation and of course, please continue to use that chat function on the side and continue asking questions throughout. All right, so with that, um, hopefully, uh, I'm going to put up a poll um, to, and you should see it in front of you, I hope, right now. Um, and if you could please ask, uh, answer these two questions. Uh, if you are on a mobile, device you might have to swipe left to see the questions and um, it's all anonymous so go ahead and just make your selections and the purpose of these is to sort of get a read on where people are right now um, the first question as hopefully you can see there is when do you foresee the boathouse doors opening once again for your club um, and let me know if you don't see that someone can shout out if you're like i don't see that question um, Oh, it's grayed How out. Do you the, submit, the submit button does not allow you to enter it. Well, that's silly. Okay, well. Um, you have to scroll down. There's two questions. So hopefully if you answer both at the very bottom, you can submit that, those, uh, those responses. So the first one is just talking a little bit about timing. Um, and then the second is just talking about sort of where you're going to be starting from when boathouse doors open up and sort of the current engagement level that you have with your members at this time. Excellent. I'm going to leave it open for about another uh, 20 seconds or so. Excellent. So getting those submissions in, if you already haven't done so, we're going to go ahead and close the poll. And, oh good, it doesn't show. Oh, it says you're seeing the poll results, but I cannot. That's great. Um, <laughs> I'm going to call in Patrick here. Patrick, we're improvising. Can you, uh, can you just discuss a little bit about what it shows? For some reason, it's saying I'm not allowed to, uh, to see it. It's anonymous to me. So Patrick, if you could just talk a little bit about that first one in terms of timing. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, no one is currently open, which uh, obviously we all, we all kind of know that, I guess. Uh, uh, 24% of uh, uh, respondents will open in May, expect opening in May. Uh, the majority of people expect to open in June, 39% of us. Uh, 20% July and August, 15% fall, and 2% uh, not until 2021. Uh, and then uh, yeah, on the, uh, on the second question there, uh, the majority of, of respondents, 44% of them are communicating and actively engaged with the membership uh, at a slightly reduced capacity. So it just you know, shows how important the face-to-face -face work in the facility and with the athletes is. Well, fabulous. Thank you so much for the, the help there. All right, so I'm gonna just close those. So as you can kind of see, um, you know, we're all, we're all in a, in the same situation in terms of currently being closed. So certainly just looking at that horizon, seeing when people think and hope um, things are gonna be opening. Um, and then also that, just that connection piece to current members. Um, and, you know, that's also gonna play into sort of that plan looking ahead. So thanks so much everybody for sharing. Um, all right, now to kick things off today, uh, we have three coaches, directors, and leaders here to share a little bit more about what their specific clubs and organizations are looking towards for the future. Um, we have Chris Chase from US Rowing, um, Patrick uh, McGovern, who was just speaking from um, the GPRF, um, Pocock Rowing Center and Renton Rowing Center, and Andrew Purdy from the Indianapolis Rowing Center. Uh, so thank you all for being willing to be here and sharing some of your ideas and thoughts with the group today. Um, to start things off, I would like to invite Chris Chase, Director of Youth Rowing for U.S. Rowing, to give us a brief overview of what the national landscape is looking like for the immediate future of rowing in this country and how it might impact program goals when we go back. Um, is there a shift in focus? Uh, where should Boathouse leaders focus their programs on once they can open their doors again. So with that, Chris. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm not sure I have any answers, direct, you know, straight up answers, um, because it seems like as we look around the landscape, everybody's in a different scenario. Um, different parts of the country are, are not certainly what we're at with the, um, in the tri-state area up here. I mean, we're getting hammered. Um, and, you know, even as we reach its peak, I'm not sure that it bodes well for, for instance, club nationals to be held in, in July. I mean, obviously we would hope and we plan as if it's going off, but I'm not sure New Jersey, who has their, their parks closed down right now, is going to be looking for a gathering of 10,000 people to show up in early July. So, um, you know, in my daily uh, dealings with clubs across the country, I find a variety of two things, a variety of state and you know, local, state and federal rules that are being, that are being applied. And uh, recently, uh, unfortunately, I'm finding um, a lot of people who are interpreting those rules, uh, well, let's say liberally or loosely, you know, on how they think they should apply to themselves. So we actually have some people that are, are back on the water and doing things or have been doing things for the last month because they said that they interpret the rules differently. And I think that's a very dangerous way to, to approach this. Um, <clears throat> the members are the lifeblood of the clubs. Totally understand all that, but I would say that we should be erring, in, uh, you know, in the say on the side of safety before we rush to get everybody back so that we can get back to business as usual. Um, and I, you know, like uh, every Monday we have a, a, a call with um, our doctors, our, our medical commission. We have some USOPC people on there. We have our judge referees on there, and um, there's not really a clear answer, right? I, I think that most people agree with phasing it in. And um, from the club level, you know, I don't know if that uh, some of the problems that I, we've spoken about and, and Matt Lowe could talk just as, as much about this as every Friday we have a standing call with with 13 or so uh, executive directors of major of the large clubs in the country. And, um, you know, phasing things in would mean like have a couple of people down come down early on in the beginning, come down and use small boats. Or then the questions arise, well, which group in our boathouse comes first? The juniors, the masters, the, you know, who, who do we invite back first? Can we invite back one part of the club and not another part of the club? Um, how do we phase in? You know, I think uh, Richard Hall was talking about, they figured out mathematically that they could do eight shifts a day. So if they were to split it up by shifts, could you do it eight shifts? You know, they could do eight shifts a day. 
Um, th then the questions become, well, how do you keep the, the, uh, the site uh, clean? How do you keep the bathrooms or the equipment clean for the next group to be able to use them? You know, what puts you in the line of fire for having too many people using the same things and not catching it? I spoke to somebody yesterday that said they were going to do uh, check temperatures and try to, you know, as people show up, check temperatures and see who can, you know, are, are there any outward signs where they could catch something before they interact with other members of the club? I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know as much about it. I, I don't know if you can do that. I don't know if people, you know, who, are, uh, who have no symptoms, if you can catch that uh, by checking temperatures. Um, I know that people, I mean, when we look at, for instance, losing Masters Nationals from the West Coast, and, and as we search for a new location to host that, if we can, um, I know that's a big, a big portion of, of planning for a club. You know, that's a massive regatta uh, and it's important to our masters. Um, you know, it comes with its own problems. What site could handle that? Do they want to handle that? What, what states have rules right now about uh, how big a, a crowd can you bring? I mean, some states are just getting back now with 10 or less. Um, which, by the way, I've already heard of clubs breaking that rule. On the first day, uh, you can't have more than 10 people. I've already heard of clubs inviting as many as, you know, a whole bunch of people to get down there, plus their coaching staff, and go way, almost double that number. Um, how does that look for us as an NGB? I don't know. I don't know how these clubs that I've heard are breaking it have our insurance. How does that come into it if you have U.S. rowing insurance? Um, you know, Greg's on the call. He's on the board as well. Um, what happens with our guidelines? Are they rules to live by or are they just guidelines? And how can they be interpreted when you want to or need to? And um, when are they applied? So, I mean, we have as many questions as all of you. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the concerns that we have is that people are looking, and, and I don't want to speak out of line, by the way. This is, I'm not on the board. I'm an employee. Um, but I also know that when we look at this problem, we look at at times 1,460 clubs and all of you in different states in different periods of time with this epidemic or this pandemic. When, you know, um, we can't make a one size fits all set of guidelines because everybody is currently going through this at different rates. Um, and so as, as our rates are starting to top off and decline in New York, other states are starting to um, blossom is totally the wrong word, but starting to grow and, and catch fire. So, um, you know, we don't know if we'll have those events in the summer. We don't know if the states that would allow an event will, will by then allow that. And if we're in some of these places that want to host it, do they really want trailer filled, you know, with people coming from states that have just exploded with COVID? Um, so I don't know if I've answered any of your questions at all, Heather, <laughs> or helped in any way, shape or form, but, but uh, you know, we're at, I mean, that's where we're at. Each of your individual problems times 1460. No, well, we really appreciate that, Chris. And, you know, I think, I think that's one of the big challenges right now is nobody has all the answers. And, you know, just trying to gain the most information from all the resources as possible, I think is certainly valuable. Uh, we do have one question. Um, and if there's a timeline for making decisions on nationals and masters nationals at this point. Uh, yes. And I'll say that tentatively. Um, Things seem to change so quickly and so dramatically. We had a timeline to, to announce youths, and uh, our timeline was had multiple uh, stops along the way. And we reached a point where the board just had so much information that we had to make a decision on, you know, well before what our timeline is. We have a timeline now, and there are factors that are outside of our control. For instance, for masters, I don't think at this point we even have a location um, uh, nailed down, an alternative location that is suitable. Um, and you know, I could be wrong in that, I'll find out that answer tomorrow at our meeting, but um, I don't think we have one nailed down yet. And even then, some of the options are in places where they are just starting to increase with the pandemic. And, and how will that change? And how much do, you re do we want you all to rely on that? So we do have a, um, a, a timeline where we have asked ourselves to make um, decisions by. But again, all bets are off if it appears that we're going to put anybody 
in the line of fire. If, if there's anything that's unsafe or unresponsi uh, un unresponsible on our part to do this, we will cut bait uh, as soon as we know that that to be the truth. Does that make sense? Like if we know that following along this timeline would, would have all of you guys planning off that timeline and we know we're not gonna be able to do it, we will, we will certainly do it a lot faster. People were angry with us when we, when we uh, canceled youth nationals. People, we had people that were quite angry with us for doing it, quote unquote, too quickly, or you know, we, uh, we were overly sensitive. But I mean, basically where we were at is there was no way we were going to be able to get that kind of movement or even ask people to travel across the country with that many kids to a regatta that we knew we couldn't guarantee safety. So yes, we do have a timeline, D, um, and uh, the exact dates for both are different, and they are also attached to things that are out of our control, and that is nailing down locations and uh, what the local governments and state governments will say. You know, a lot of them won't say yes now to us anyways. They can't guarantee us that we can even do it. All right, thank you. Any other questions for Chris while we have him here? Feel free to use the chat function, or if you don't have that available, just unmute yourself. I have a question. Um, hi, Chris. Thanks for coming. I appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man. Um, has U.S. Rowing uh, um, given thought to publishing or announcing um, rules or guidelines with regard to the insurance? Um, so, in other words, you know, when I, I think it's pretty logical that it's going to be, you know, first it's ten people, and then it's twenty-five people, and then it's fifty people. Um, is there any chance that our insurance will be voided if it's 12 people instead of 10? Um, and if so, and I would assume that maybe that's possible, um, is, is U.S. Rowing considering publishing any kind of like, here are the rules, you've got to follow these rules, or, you know, you're on your own type of thing? Uh, it's uh, uh, interesting that you're asking that question today because most of my morning has been spent chasing around a few people who uh, have no intention of following strict guidelines like that. And as was pointed out to one club, or by one club, when they were answering questions by, by their municipality, their response to their municipality was that ours were just guidelines, they weren't rules. And so we're playing a little game, a little, you know, which infuriates me, obviously. So even when you say, are we gonna put out guidelines, the guidelines are only as good as they're interpreted, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and people are trying to, I understand, the situation that people are in. I really do. Um, but the first club to go back that I know of showed up with 17 people at it, you know, so already we're at square one, right? Um, you know, like a breaking, breaking a guideline. Uh, one of the questions that I have out today, Nick, is will our insurance actually um, cover, you know, and wh where's the liabilities stand if, if, uh, if, if teams are doing different things, even in, in the same areas? Um, you know, in, in the East Coast, on our Friday call, uh, you know, Matt Logue uh, hosts, you know, one team on a river has already got their people going out in small boats. And the other teams are like, well, hold on a second. If they can do it, we can do it. And generally speaking, just because the first person who does it doesn't mean they're right. So everybody following that person and pointing to them and saying, hey, they're doing it. We should be able to do it is actually the ass backwards way of, of, of following, I think. I think that people should find out. And, and, and I'll get a better answer, hopefully, from our insurance company. Originally, when we had the insurance question about if we hosted our events, if there were guys that had U.S. Rowing insurance, our insurance company initially said it's, if, if they've already signed up and already paid and they were going to host it on that day, assuming that the state and local governments allow them, yes, they're still covered. But you raise another question, and that is things like the 10-person rule. When's the exact date that it goes into in, in effect? When, what are the other stipulations? Um, and I think it gets very dicey fast, depending on where you're at, what your municipality says, what your state says. And one, one example, I'll, I'll say that a parks guy gave a different answer than the governor and the local municipality. And of course, the club sided with the parks guy because he implied that they could still row, right? Uh, even though nobody else in the state was doing it. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know. And that's why I'm trying to find out the answer. I don't want us to be liable for, for misdeeds, but I also don't want us to be putting out rules that are all encompassing when they're not actually shouldn't be all encompassing, depending on where you're located. 
Does that help, Nick, at all? I mean, yeah, it, it does. I mean, I think I think we're all kind of paying attention to what our local state governments are saying, and 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 certainly I'm taking my cue first and foremost from the governor of Oregon. Um, but but it is helpful to be able to communicate to our membership. Um, this is U.S. Rowing's position, and certainly if if the insurance if there was a specific rule related to insurance, that would help me talk to my constituents and say, look, you know. We're not going to fudge this. We have to do it right, in part because it's the right thing to do, but in part because we need coverage for insurance. And you know, every little piece of information that we can give that kind of reinforces the decisions that we're making is helpful. And that kind of leadership from U.S. Rowing is helpful. And I know the decisions that you're making in terms of the regattas and, and so on and so forth are very, very difficult. But it's a lot easier for us to talk to our athletes and say, look, you know, everyone's putting their brains together. This is just not going to work. Um, and, and it's helpful if it's consistent from the government, U.S. rowing, the heads of the programs. The more we can be kind of aligned in that, the easier it's going to be to sell the right, the right plan, right? The plan that's going to be safe for everyone. That's, that's my only question is, is there any kind of, you know, I just want to encourage you to continue out, send, send guidance out, even if you're afraid, you know, that some people aren't going to like it, um, you know, in a vacuum, then then we run into trouble where you know the club down the river is doing it so i want to do it you know like you know that gets really awkward yeah uh, i mean um as i said and i'm sorry if i sound evasive i'm tiptoeing around because i'm looking square into the eyes of one of our board members and i don't want to say the wrong thing right. um and i encourage that board member to say whatever he wants right now by just unmuting uh, but i am not <laughs> going to uh, i won't take liberties mr board member um, with your authority. So, uh, you know, I won't, I don't want to overspeak. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I would echo Chris's, um, comments that pay really close attention to attention to local ordinances and guidelines, because, you know, those are going to be the first things that you want to make sure that you, um, are in adherence with, I think secondarily besides liability, um, be sensitive to the fact that, um, you know, a breach of those guidelines could open you up to a, a safe sport, um, issue. And um, uh, that's something that um, USOPC is taking extremely seriously right now. Um, so, um, you know, it's interesting. I was in um, Europe when um, the travel ban went into effect. We were about to race in Amsterdam and, and the regatta got canceled um, 36 hours before we started racing. And the biggest concern that they had, um, and they had had hygiene protocols in place in all the clubs on the Amstel um, prior to the, um, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the um, cancellation. The biggest thing they had a concern about was something that was echoed earlier on this call, which was people coming from a place where there had been a surge. And in, in their situation, they had a lot of clubs coming up from the southern um, part of the Netherlands. Um, and um, yeah, I think, um, 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 you know, everything is going to be really circumstantially specific, but I, the, the, the bottom line is, you know, follow the, follow the guidance of your local authorities really closely. I'd like to say something else. Uh, we had a specific, I'll give you a specific example of opening up where a rowing club has uh, warped the intention. So in New York, the governor's opening up marinas. And there's a rowing team on the island, on Long Island, that rows out of a marina. And so he called me up and he was very excited to tell me that they're going to start rowing this past Saturday because the marina is now open for business. And I said to him, you're not a, a marina. You're an athletic team that rows. You are not the marina. The marina is open for business. That is not your business. And he, we argued for probably 20 minutes. He did not want to hear it. The marina was open. The governor said it was okay. We're in the marina. We're rowing. And I just said, that's not what your mission statement is. Like, your mission statement is to keep the kids safe. Like, you're crazy. And um, we actually, as a state, put out an email that said, if you row right now during all the shutdown, you will no longer be allowed to come to New York State Champs. Therefore, no longer allowed to make it to youth nationals. That was our only way of, of just when I say we, not me as a U.S. rowing person, but me as a board member for the NYSSRA, you know, we just we had to take away something that that they valued, so that they weren't going to be frivolous with their interpretation of the of these new rules. So, I would say this, and I'll say this with Greg on the call. I love that you all are asking for U.S. rowing 
to provide guidance and leadership. And I encourage all of you to express that to our board and our CEO. Because I think there are times that we get an analysis paralysis, and I, yes, I'm risking my job, I know, Greg, um, that we get in this analysis paralysis and that we as U.S. Rowing are afraid to piss off people or make the wrong call. And I just, I, I personally, I, I live by it's never the wrong time to make the right, to do the right thing. So please encourage us and hold us to the flame. To provide yeah, I mean, just, just to pick up on that European um, 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 thing, though, um, so they, they, they were surging um, a little bit before we were here in the U.S. Um, and you're starting to see some, some reopening over there. And it's pretty interesting to watch what's going on in the Netherlands and Ireland and Denmark and Croatia at the athletic club level. Um, I think this, again, back to the, the Netherlands in particular, um, they've got a ban on organized sport until April 28th. And starting April 28th, um, um, U19s are going to be allowed out in small boats um, with guidelines on social distancing. And small boats, small boat elites are going to be allowed back into the training center now. The guidance there is coming from the National Olympic Committee. And that's a very different thing because it covers the whole country where we're, we're dealing with a mosaic of, of, of jurisdictions um, and, and governing authorities and, and, and public health bodies. But I, I think if you, if you want to see examples of how people are gradually reopening, um, spending some time poking around what's going on over in Europe is, 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 you know, is an interesting use of time. Hey, can I can I just make a, a comment about that? And again, I really appreciate having U.S. Rowing on this on this call. Uh, it means a lot. Um, you know, during this during this period, I've been trying to come up with information from uh, for my athletes and provide them with workouts. And you know, um, we're taking the opportunity to learn about other rowing cultures and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, Rowing Australia has uh, a lot of wonderful things that they offer on their webpage and and New Zealand and. And, and Great Britain and all the rest, um, you know, I will definitely be looking around and I continue to look around Europe. But what I'd like to see is the United States, um, you know, proffering some information as well. So, so if, if I could just suggest, um, I understand that it's very difficult given the size of our country and, and you know, we're all going to be phasing at different times to, to come up with a cookie cutter thing. But would it be possible for you guys to produce, uh, this, is, this is what U.S. Rowing suggests you should consider um, as you're considering opening back up. Have you thought about safe sport? Have you thought about how you're going to keep people safe in the boathouse? Have you thought about how you're going to keep people safe on the water? And, and that seems to me like, okay, you know, then I don't have to search around and make it, you know, then it's coming from, from our leadership. This is the kind of stuff that you should be thinking about. You're not necessarily telling us this is the answer for you, but you know, the, the safe sport piece, I think a lot of people are going to miss. Um, and it could get us into a trouble just as much as the virus. Right. So um, I think that's fantastic. And, and the, the wisdom of our leadership, if, if that could be offered would be wonderful. I'd, I'd really, really appreciate that. The, um, um, and I think that'd be a great service for all of us. Nick, let me, let me just point out something to you all. Um, upcoming two of the webinars, one is on while we're, you know, while we're isolated, let's rethink our safety. And Rachel Lemieux and uh, Matt Logue are doing that. It's a Friday night and it is going to be, or is it a Friday or Saturday? I'm sorry, Matt. Uh, anyways, it's a whole talk about uh, just having a, a fresh look at all of our safety protocols in boat houses. So that's one. The other one is things to think about before we open up. And that will, that will cover all of the phasing aspects. And that's, I think, in two to three weeks. So there's going to be a whole thing about, you know, what should we be thinking about? Transcending what the governor says, right? Or, right. or you know, what are the things that we should uh, be thinking about? And they, it will vary depending on the size of your club and what you offer. Yeah. Um, so they, those things are coming up. Uh, and then you mentioned the other countries that have a lot of good stuff, uh, workouts and all that. We are creating right now, we're, we're, we're fleshing out the archive that will have thousands of, of stuff in there. We're already doing that. So yeah. I, wanted you to, I wanted you to know that. I know you guys are working your butts off, so I really appreciate that. And, and put, that, put the safety stuff right on the webpage there so it's the first, people, the first thing people see because uh, that, that's, that's critical, obviously, right now. If, you, if, if uh, Heather will send me the emails or I'll send the stuff to her, I'll get go. out every single webinar and you can get it out to everybody each of you knows. There you um, go. Uh, interesting thing about safe sport. We had somebody get uh, sued for a safe sport violation 
the summer. Uh, it was brought to the US OPC. The US OPC checked the database for this executive director's uh, status. And this executive director of a major club in the United States was not even a US rowing member. And we were told at the time that we couldn't go any further with the investigation because he wasn't a member of our organization. So imagine, think about that. If your coaches and your, your people aren't US rowing members, but you expect us to have oversight over them, there's actually a loophole. So when our coaches and board members, or our, our executive directors and stuff, aren't even members of the organization, it's kind of a catch-22 when they, you know, when people are asking us to have oversight when their people are slipping through the cracks by choosing not to be a member in the first place. So I just wanted to, I don't want to belay that. I just wanted to. It was an interesting uh, bit of knowledge for me to learn that there was an extent to what we, which we could. Uh, explore a safe sport violation until we got to the point that that person wasn't even a member and they were executive director of a top 10 team. Well, thank you all so much, um, Chris, Greg, and Nick for all of the insight and all of this. And, you know, I think, um, Chris, I will certainly send out all, all of the webinars and everything to the group. Um, and then also checking out U.S. Rowing's future webinars that they're hosting um, that Chris mentioned as well. So uh, continue, keep those questions coming in the chat function and we'll try to get them um, get answers to all of them as we continue to progress through this call. Um, and thank you so much for, for your time, um, Chris and Greg as well for hopping on there. Um, that We really appreciate that uh, a lot. Um, with that, we're going to continue to build on this conversation. Um, however, I'm going to uh, shift things a little bit to more of the uh, individual club level and then approach the individual clubs. Um, I'm going to shift it over to uh, Patrick and Andrew um, from uh, Patrick from Pocock and Renton Rowing Centers and Andrew from Indianapolis Rowing Club. Um, both are Boathouse leaders and directors in their respective clubs. Um, and Patrick and Andrew, um, Patrick, starting with you, could you please share some more specific action points that you're taking as you sort of look forward to the opening of your boathouses? We'll get you on uh, mute, Patrick. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, I think the first step in the process is uh, you know, just to make sure that we're engaging, uh, engaging the right people and as many people as we possibly can, and engaging them in the right level of the conversation. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, there's certainly no shortage of ideas. There's certainly no shortage of uh, a variety of people's desires to get back on the water or get back in team rowing. Uh, yeah, people have a lot of opinions and. Uh, yeah, so sort of managing that information with all of our stakeholders is really important. Uh, a couple of real specific things that we've been doing. Uh, number one, uh, making sure that you know, using our existing structures of key staff, uh, I think that's been a real, real important thing that so that I can get the correct information and listen to, uh, you know, keep my finger on the on the pulse of the organization really accurately. Uh, you know, I do a lot of listening from athletes, from staff, from board members, and other constituents. Uh, I think one thing that we've got coming out in the next few days is going to be a survey of both our youth athletes and our adult athletes to get a sense, a very specific sense of where they are and, you know, when they think they might return, if they would plan on returning to rowing and to try and uh, get a deeper sense of what their criterion are to, to get back to the boathouse. So, uh, yeah, as part of that, uh, part of that information management, I think, is also uh, sort of preparing people for worst case scenarios. So one thing that we've been doing over the past couple months is essentially creating a white paper for our boards so people understand the potential ramifications of boathouse closures and of really this, this entire pandemic. So I think that's been something that's been really good so that when we get to a decision point, it's not a surprise that we're at a decision point. I think, uh, and people don't like surprises and people don't like, you know, all of a sudden drastic things to happen. So uh, preparing people for these possibilities, I think it's been real, yeah, been real important. So yeah, Andrew. Yeah, I think, uh, I think our approach has been uh, pretty much in line with what Chris was talking about in terms of the phase in, in, you know, we've been talking about what, whenever our governor decides to you know lift the stay-at-home order um you know how can we best open the boathouse in a you know in a safe um way and we're 
obviously um, we're obviously prioritizing, you know, um, the governor's uh, guidelines and safety of the rowers above anything else, which means that likely when we open up, we'll open up with the small boats as, as uh, some of the other clubs have been doing, um, you know, monitoring, make sure everybody's, you know, sticking with the singles and, and things like that. Um, obviously that we've put together basically a, a group of, you know, half dozen, six to eight people that represent uh, stakeholders, as Patrick was saying, of, of, you know, junior parents, masters rowers, board members, um, myself, just kind of coming together every week to, to update, you know, and sometimes every week doesn't seem like often enough, but um, in terms of what we're going to be doing um, right now, actually, the, the last couple of weeks have been dealing with um, juniors. I don't, I don't know how other people are structuring their, but our junior spring season obviously is not going to happen. So we're trying to figure out the, the um, refunds versus donation question with all the uh, junior families. But being able to talk through that with people and communicate that, uh, we do our weekly communication to our members and we've kept that going even when we didn't necessarily have a whole lot of new or positive information to pass along just to try and keep people engaged. Um, on, obviously on the junior side of things, our, uh, our coaches are doing a fantastic job of keeping the junior rowers engaged. But, um, you know, as Patrick and I were um, emailing, bringing up the idea of, of putting a uh, survey out there in terms of what the criterion are for people to want to return to rowing. Um, I mean, I'm a master's rower. I love rowing, so I assume everybody wants to come back to rowing. But maybe that's not the case. I don't, I, I shouldn't assume that, so. Um, but it sounds like, you know, there's a lot of similarities there. Well, thank you both. Yeah. Um, so con let's uh, continue this discussion. We're going to try breaking out into some breakout rooms just so everyone can sort of start to collaborate and discuss um, about um, what what people, you know, are, are looking towards um, while we are reopening. Um, we will go into the breakout rooms. Um, there'll be about six participants in each room. Um, and feel free to unmute yourself once you get there. Um, we'll have about five to six minutes in this room, so it's going to be pretty quick. Um, please, um, you know, contribute to the conversation as best you can. If you are unable to and you're just simply listening to this call today, you know, just absorb what you hear. But this is an opportunity to really connect, share, and learn from each other. Um, and I will be calling you back. You don't have to push anything. It automatically kind of puts you there and it will bring you back when the time is up. Um, so don't push any crazy buttons, don't leave the meeting. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing some of the highlights of your conversations. All right, uh, so here we go. You should, uh, you should find yourself there. Coming back, we will get uh, started as soon as everyone's back with us. Too short, Heather, it was too short. I know, we could probably talk all day. I know there are some amazing conversations going on. I hate cutting it short. <laughs> Welcome back as everyone's popping back in. Welcome. Hopefully uh, everyone made it in and out of the breakout room okay. Um, some really fantastic conversations that I was hearing as I was popping in and out of rooms. Um, you know, and I wish we could have all day to continue the discussion because, you know, I think it is such a value to continue to connect. Um, however, I did want to go to one more um, topic area and we will have one more opportunity to break out into an, an additional breakout room. Um, but uh, I'd like to move it back to Andrew and Patrick just to get the conversation started a little bit uh, about some barriers and realities that, you know, they're trying to prepare for um, more, not less on like the policy and big, big ticket items, but the specifics that could potentially happen. Again, no crystal ball, no playbook with all of this, but what are some some real true barriers and realities? Um, so I'll, I will ask Andrew to kick us off on this conversation piece. Well, um, <clears throat> as we were talking about in our small group session, um, one of the things that I, I envision, as much as I'd love to say oh, the boathouse is open for singles and privately owned doubles and call. just leave it to that 
um, yeah, I think there's going to be a little bit more oversight that's going to be needed. That's really cool. Um, and as the executive director, I'm, I'm going to go ahead. Them in my eye socket right now. If you are not muted, if you could please mute yourself. Um, thank you so much. Continuing um, on, Andrew. I, yeah, I, I just feel like there's going to be some oversight needed. Um, and that's why, at least initially, we're going to open up for specific number of uh, hours and specific days. And people will just do online reservations of, if you've got your own single, you can take it out. If you, you know, we'll make five or so of the club singles available. And that way, we can kind of um, keep the the crowd to a minimum, as well as kind of keep some oversight on what boats are being taken out, as well as um, the, you know, sanitizing things and making sure everything stays cleaned uh, in between rowing, you know, rowers and stuff like that. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, and Patrick, turning it over to you, some of the barriers and realities that you're trying to prepare for with opening up. For sure, the uh, realities are uh, not not pleasant. To be uh, completely frank with everyone, um, you know, we found uh, you know we all know this that that the economies of rowing uh, it depend largely for many clubs. I would assume for clubs over about twenty people, uh, the economy of the sport really depends on densely populated practice times, densely populated facilities. Um, you know, we could really easily see 100 to 150 people in a 10,000 square foot facility in the past. Um, that's not going to be happening for a long time. Uh, when we look and see about a big demographic uh, of participants in rowing are over the age of 60. They're in high risk groups. Uh, again, I mentioned before about people's comfort level. Uh, people could be in a high risk group at any age you know we have a, a youth athlete who is in a, in a very high risk group so as we look and see about the financial reality of running a boathouse with 60 to 80 percent at 60 to 80 percent of what we used to run it uh that's a that's really difficult um again when we look and see about the model of staffing you know, a lot of times i think we're, our clubs probably aren't unique in having a 16 to 16 athlete to one coach ratio um yeah and the reality is that we either have to right have more coaches or less coaching per athlete i mean there's just a lot of realities there uh and then again obviously the uh simply the the administrative weight of running facilities uh you know if we don't have a densely populated facility of 60 percent of the members 70 percent of the members Right, then those are staff positions that get cut. I think all of our careers have been spent building communities and building organizations. So this has been a real interesting exercise in deconstructing the organization, right? I think, you know, our prior model was, how can we offer more? <clears throat> Excuse me, how can we offer more services? How can we offer more coaching? How can we offer, uh, you know, better administration? And, and at this point in time, uh, yeah, I think unfortunately we're looking at being able to haven't been required to offer less, maybe rely on volunteers more, maybe just simply have a smaller community, uh, which, yeah, those are some pretty, pretty stark questions that uh, yeah, will change the sport for a long time, we think, so, yeah. Well, thank you both for, for those thoughts. Um, all right, we're gonna take that and sort of as our kickoff point to go back into some small groups once again um, to discuss some of those barriers and realities that your individual club are trying to prepare and navigate um, as we hopefully reopen. Um, we'll have approximately six minutes again, uh, and then you'll automatically be returned to the larger group. Again, they'll be um, randomly assigned um, and unmute yourself when you arrive, and please take this time to connect, share, and learn from each other. All right, here we go. Well, welcome back, everybody, as everyone finds their way back to the main room. Um, such great and rich conversation that I heard as I was popping in and out of all the breakout rooms. Um, I hope that uh, some questions and new thoughts were able to be generated um, during that discussion. If there's 
Um, we have time for about one or two questions. If anyone has a pressing question they would like to post to the group, if you could please um, go ahead and put it in the chat um, to the side, that would be great. Or else, um, if you don't have the chat function, if you can unmute yourself. However, we only have time for one or two at this time before we need to start wrapping up. Uh, PPP statistics. Um, could anyone comment in the chat function if they have in fact received the PPP? <laughs> I did hear one group. There was somebody who was saying they had. I know many who haven't. Commencement Bay has. Commencement Bay, wonderful. I love to hear that. As did Rogue Rowing. Wonderful. Saratoga did. And Saratoga, fabulous. Most, I will say that most people on, uh, that I know of around here in this area got it. So I don't know if that's good news or bad. Yeah, <laughs> that East Coast, uh, uh, right? We, we, we um, gave ours to Harvard. Well, great. Well, there's a uh, excellent. I know Nick's joking. He's cracking jokes. Uh, lots of did not, but um, it's great to see that some some facilities and programs did. Uh, Three Rivers did as well. Um, excellent. Um, there is also one other question that we might take offline um, since it will uh, spark a little bit further discussion about what happens to our sport without racing. So, you know, potentially that's something that we can to think about um, and a little bit how we could, um, you know, pivot the focuses of virtual training and goals um, and thinking about, you know, for how long and how long that keeps people motivated. So I'm gonna just sort of throw that question out there to start pondering that and potentially something we can come back to since that is a reality. Um, but with that, you know, I, I would like to start wrapping things up for today and certainly some really great conversation um, and we really appreciate uh, everything that, you know, everyone contributed to the conversation today. Uh, hopefully you found some valuable connections and conversations um, that you were able to be a part of this past hour. Um, I just want to say, you know, from a personal standpoint, uh, through the past few weeks, I've just been continued to be blown away by the rowing community at large. Um, you know, I've had the incredible privilege to connect with many of you. Um, through in between these calls. Uh, and I've just been so uh, impressed by each and every one of your continued um, drive and passion towards keeping your members and communities connected and alive through this time. And, you know, we really are part of a really special sport. Um, I think once a rower, always a rower. And I'm looking forward to when uh, you know, we can start bringing people back together physically um, and bring new people into this incredible worldwide community. Um, but also, please continue to give yourself grace through this time. Uh, nobody has the playbook or crystal ball, uh, and we don't really know what's in the future. So, you know, thank you to each and every one of you for making this sport what it is and evolving this sport as we move forward. Um, we will be hosting another call. And um, in a couple of weeks time, please look for a follow up email from me later um, with the recording of this call. Unfortunately, we won't get all the incredible breakout room conversations, which I think would be so valuable to share. Um, but we'll get the gist of the call as well as a survey about what you need sort of going forward and what you would like to hear um, and use this group as um, to find out more about. So with that, thank you so much to Chris, Patrick, Andrew, um, Greg, and everybody else who contributed to this today. And I hope everyone stays healthy and hope to see you in a couple of weeks time. All right, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.